I'm here to talk about the fact that we have mice strains coming our way and we are strongly obligated to present this information. There's, uh, I think, 11 strains, 12, 10, something like that. And uh, every... Basically, we don't know what to do at the moment because our whole stack of software is not built around the idea of having more than one of a single species. So there's more question marks than solutions at the moment. Um, basically, our current stack says one database on a server is for one species. And when that doesn't fit, such as when you have 10 fully fledged mice genomes, uh, we have to, we are in the interim, because we have strong time pressure, going to have to do 10 databases for 10 mice strains, or 12 indeed. Um, <coughs> and this is, this is an uncomfortable situation, because we're really bending our architecture to accommodate something which, and we're duplicating so much information in each of these databases. Um, all the annotation gets copied across between them. Uh, so we, this hasn't happened yet, but this is, this is wh where we're going to be summer this year, I think, when we finally get this data out. We're going to have 10 mouse databases replicating 99% of the information in each of them. It's ridiculous, but changing our entire architecture is going to take us longer than six months. Um, worse still, I mentioned earlier, uh, Genomics England have gone a bit bananas and have produced or producing a huge number of uh, human genomes. And we don't really want a huge number of databases. It would be much better if we had perhaps one database per species of all the annotation and a perhaps variant graph behind it, allowing you to explore the sequence of variations within that. Um, so that would, that would really save us from an oncoming locomotive. Um, on top of this, uh, the UK is rather keen on its position as um, as historical leader in genomics, and uh, the recent rise of CRISPR-Cas9 and the ability to actually modify genomes live means that you can't. We've got this wonderful biological toolkit borrowed from the bacteria which we can use to modify stuff, but we don't know what we're doing. We've got a reference genome with annotation on it, but in an individual patient that you want to apply gene therapy to, you don't know what you're fixing because you haven't, you haven't got the, the tool set to join up the reference genome, that annotation, compare it with the live patient and go, you know, if we fix this, will that solve the problem? What will, will, it, will it even match? Have we sequenced them correctly, blah, blah, blah. It's, so they are held back by our tooling not being sufficiently capable. Um, I mean, yes, CRISPR will go through a few more generations of improvement before it's the kind of thing you might point at a patient. But I think it will take us longer to catch up with the individual genome problem. Um, so on the topic of scale, um, I'm more concerned with annotation than I am with uh, nodes of sequence strings. Um, Ensemble has about 200 million accessions, most of them are RSIDs, for human. Um, the grand total of all the species is not terribly easy to sum up, so I didn't bother. But in a scenario of having all of our species equally well annotated, we're probably not looking more than half a billion accessions per species. And these, these are a big number, but it's not a really big number. So that means that things like triple stores and um, the whatever uh, Eric's code ends up being called, um, <laughs> These things, that we, I, have, I have strong hopes that this is all scalable within memory available and database systems being up to snuff. I'm encouraged by the scale of what we have. Um, and I don't think we're going, I think we're, we're definitely going to plateau in terms of the annotations we have and the particularly variant counts. Um, 
because the Thousand Genomes Project gave us good coverage, and what I'm hearing from people is that we haven't expressed all of the variety in humanity, for sure, and um, the talk we had earlier about the Japanese reference indicates that there's quite a lot of stuff that's been missed so far. But we've got a big chunk of the variation already sort of captured, so there's a bit more growth to come, but it's not going to be a hundred times more data, which means if we can do it now with what we have, in five, ten years' time, computers will be more capable, and basically it means we're, we might be able to make a go of this, make production services on it. Um, there is a ton of other stuff, like the population frequencies, you know, what, what an RSID says about a particular population group, and that information is much larger than the, the, sh the raw accessions, but people like Eric don't need to worry about that. If, he, if his world is sequence and positions and kind of reducing that down to the minimum description, um, we just need an anchor in that, in that space. And then all our metadata can go in a different store, which is scaling appropriately for the kind of data that it is. Um, basically, Uniprot and Ensemble have been battling with this stuff for, in, my, in our case, 16 years, in their case, 30-something. Um, you know, we've already got experience with dealing with more than we're comfortable with. We can continue with that, and we will continue to do that. But what the, the kind of the insurmountable problem of 100 million, or 7 billion humans, 7 billion genomes, without the compression of a graph representation, we are so stuffed. Um, so then I was thinking about, well, how do we actually put our accessions onto the graph? Where do we put them? Um, I've already got some RDF. I'm not saying that will be the way that we will connect to the variant graph, but it could be a good way. Um, so do we, do we have path IDs in my RDF? Could do that. Um, is there going to have to be something in the middle which connects the two sets together? Possibly. Or do we embed them in the variant graph set itself? Um, certainly Eric and I have talked about doing that. You might be able to do it. You certainly need the paths to exist in some form. But it's not clear to me where I should go. Um, So some sort of some musings on hypothetically using this in production is if you rebuild your graph because you've expanded your coverage over Africa and you've discovered more variants, um, what happens when you rebuild your graph? Do you get different location IDs? And can you, can you, how, how much work is it to transfer your annotation from a less inclusive graph to a more inclusive one? Um, don't know about that. Hopefully not a problem. Um, secondly, I think that the work of people like Eric and, um, oh, I've got your name, I beg your pardon, Uni, and indeed a lot of the Global Alliance participants. I think we need to be really careful that we don't kind of overreach and overcomplicate things by trying to expand our own scope into interesting things. If we can, if we if we keep playing to our strengths respectively, we can. Um, I think we have a better chance of getting to something we can work with, which is my priority. Um, Man, I am so jet lagged. <laughs> <coughs> so, so my last consideration is, uh, how do we as a service, Ensemble, um, interact with these varying graph tools? Do we, do we have like a standalone server that you can just spin up whenever you need it and you treat it like a <coughs> set of, dis of separate services to com 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 combine the data you need to render for the user, or do we wrap it in some kind of API so that we can access it directly? Um, I've thought about whether we should put a swig layer around the VG code so that you can 
build it into code in other languages, that might be fun. On the other hand, maybe it's just better to keep it in a little silo of its own, where you, you just fire up a VM somewhere and ta-da, you have a variant graph. Um, so these are all things I don't have a particular answer to. I'd like to sort of meditate on that through the week with people's input. Um, and then there's the concerns of people around me who think RDF is rubbish and have their own ideas about what they should be doing. Um, so one of the requirements is that we, we ultimately need to be able to do gene builds on a variant graph, possibly, at least that's, that's theorized, if we want to sort of unify everything we're doing, um, which means you need nice big contiguous se sections of sequence to uh, sort of investigate, um, to do things like <coughs> finding new genes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's actually really a problem. That might just be people talking, people imagining problems. Not sure about that. Um, we need to be able to map back to all the old assemblies because some people don't like working on the new stuff because they've spent their lives working on the old. I think that's fine within the scope of the graph. I don't think that increases the graph complexity noticeably. It gives us some more accessions to worry about, but mm. um, we need to switch between linear and graph contexts effortlessly. I also don't think that's a problem. Um, because I brought it up today already that the users don't need to know what's going on under the hood. They need to see something they can work with to aid their research. So we can, we can already present them with a linear thing built on a graph. Uh, Ensemble's current assembly table is a form of graph. It's just not anywhere near as sophisticated as the variant graph that we're working towards. Um, and the last point that's uh, been a bit of a sore point from uh, people who've sat on one too many conference calls is that the Global Alliance seems to move very slowly because there's a lot of debate. And that's generally good. Um, hopefully that's just negativity. <laughs> but the real killer thing which upset me most of all was... We don't expect this to be ready for five or, t or maybe ten years. Now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I want to have another career too. <laughs> so I, I am. Th this upsets me greatly because I, I think we can do better. I think we could. Sh I think we should surprise these people, and perhaps the way to do that, at least in my case, is to have a couple of sort of much more short-term achievable goals where we don't encompass the whole capacity of the variant graph and all the things you might possibly do with it with dozens of aligning facilities and gene builds on it. Let's go, let's go a lot simpler than that. I've got a REST API which hosts ensemble data, gets plenty of hits every year. What if we, we get 60 million sequence requests a year for like, what's the sequence of this gene? Um, and we're still ramping up in usage. That's people who could be downloading FASTA files, but they'd rather come to us and say, I want the sequence of one specific thing, lots of times. Um, why, why are we doing that with our assembly table and tons of Perl? It's slow and rubbish by comparison with what you could do with VG, I think. So why don't I try and wrap VG behind our sequence endpoint and prove that it's production ready in that respect as a read only simple thing and then and then suddenly you can just add a parameter that says and it's in this individual and stuff changes great um, and the second thing is what's really interesting which is how do we put our annotation onto the graph how do we connect it and that's a good place to finish so, you know, what, what we've got, it doesn't have to match our existing mature systems for performance and functionality. It just has to show that it's not terrible. And then we can, when we've got the maturity of, uh, you know, when, when Virtuoso is as old as the oldest relational databases, it'll be pretty good, I think. Um, <laughs> and when... The stuff we're talking about here has got another 10 years on it. And I, I see no reason why it can't have caught up with what's currently state of the art. So thank you to my funders and 
all ensemble. And any questions? Okay. So thank you very much.